I just had of one of the most fantastic conversations of my life with Arash Fasugi. He came on the podcast to talk about success, self-identity and how you transform your life. And I know every single word of what he's saying is true. My message to you is just let it in. Believe that it's possible and let this be the day that you transform your life because this is the key to success. Master riches, living a different life, becoming a different person. This is where it starts. And some of these lessons and concepts that Arash goes through and the conversation that we have together, it will transform your life if you let it. And so this is a heartfelt request from me to you. This is the stuff that you need to dig into. This is where it begins. Arash's story is phenomenal. And at the same time, I know that a lot of people have gone through this that failed to take the action that Arash did. He was very courageous and he stuck with it throughout the process. And from that, he's built a multi-million dollar business. He's a called upon influential coach to elite performers around the world. Thousands of people a year come to him and invest their time with him because they know the results. So I felt very lucky to have Arash on the show and to have some time with him because to me, just personally, I really think of Arash as a mentor and he has some truly inspirational gift in the way that he's communicating, he's simplifying some of these things so that they're really easy to grab, to pick up and to implement in your life. And the key part is implement. If you fail to implement, none of this stuff matters really. You can have a conceptual understanding of it, but it's all about implementation. So this is my gift for you guys. I know that you love this podcast, you keep coming back and that's great. This is a gift to you. And this is how you can transform your life. Arash, take it away. Well, let's kick this off. Welcome to the show. Uh, Thank you for coming on. Thanks so much, Tim. Glad to be here with you. So it has been a fascination of mine and a phenomenal thing that I've been waiting for to speak to you today. Um, and I really appreciate you, you spending the time with us and the audience. One thing I wanted to start with, if you may, is just talking through your self-transformation, because it's something that I'm really passionate about, this self-image and how you moved from losing your job, being 150K in debt, and not just any job, a six-figure job, to the lifestyle that you've got now where you're sitting in your second home probably you've got other homes as well but it it's just you've got wife and kids you're in shape you've got so many things going for you in the right aspects of life and it's just a huge transformation i'd really appreciate it if you could talk the audience through that and we can kind of get the backstory yeah sure you know it's interesting when you look back at it when you're asking me the question because you know, 13 years ago, it was the exact opposite of how I'm living now. And I, I was in the corporate world and I didn't love what I did, but I, I took myself from the bottom to the top just on, I think, uh, pure will and determination. I grew up playing sports and I think that really helped me in, you know, the afterlife after college, but I was struggling. I, like you said, I, I was 150,000 in debt and Mm -hmm. I couldn't, and I was earning a six figure income. So they didn't translate. So I was doing something wrong. Well, then I started studying personal development. And I remember when the first book I read was Think and Grow Rich. When I started searching, it's not like it is now, Tim. Now it's so easy to get, get information. But if you go back 15 years ago, you know, I was 31 years old, um, you know, and I, it was, everyone would said, go find a mentor. And I said, where do you find these mentors? <laughs> and it wasn't as easy as it is now where everybody seems to be a mentor. And, and I will tell you, um, I couldn't figure it out for three years. I went to seminars. I read hundreds of books, but my results didn't change. My results actually got worse. Uh, if you really look at it, I had the information, but they got worse and I couldn't figure it out. And I was really frustrated with it. Well, my company ended up selling. They wanted to keep me, but they wanted to cut my pay. And at this time, I was really studying personal development. I was in outside sales. And whenever I was in my car, I was listening to anybody, whether it was Earl Nightingale, whether it was Bob Proctor, Jim Rohn. And 
I, any everybody said just fill your mind with success mm -hmm. so and success leaves clues so that's what i did well at that moment they asked me to come on and i said no and for two days they were recruiting me to come back but i stayed firm in that decision and i always called that a pivotal moment in my life because there was nothing in my physical reality that said say no you know i was getting married three weeks later anyway I ended up having a mutual acquaintance with uh, Bob Proctor and Bob got on the phone with me and he said, well, what is it that you want? And I said, I want to create a life of freedom doing what I love. He says, what do you love? I said, I'm not really sure. And he said, well, I can help you. He said, if you'll do what I tell you. And I, and I didn't know he did mentorship at the time. Mentorship was a new phrase for me. Anyway, he said, but the prerequisite is you have to do exactly what I tell you to do. And at that moment, I said yes. And I didn't know what that meant, but I said yes. And I did, I literally did exactly what he told me, but I will tell you this. I didn't think it was going to work. And I say that very honestly, because I look back to my last three years of being in the personal development and really studying it. And my results actually went backwards, like I said. Well, Bob told me, he said, I said, I've spent a lot of money on this and nothing's changed. And I said, will this really work? He said, until you find out I'm a liar, I don't know what I'm talking about. He said, then you can come back to me. So I ended up making it a game. And I said, I'm already 150,000 in debt. What's a few more thousand? That was my mindset at the time. And I said, let me see if it works. But I was never coachable. I had a big problem with discipline. I'd start, stop, start, stop. Well, in that one year, and I still, and Bob and I talked about this for so long. I said, I still don't know why I did exactly what you told me because I'd never done that in my life. And I did exactly what he told me. Within that first year, I released 42 pounds of weight. I discovered my purpose, which is what I do now, which is coach people. And I took my, I took 150,000, I eliminated the debt, earned a positive 282. Within two years, I was earning a million dollars. That was beyond me. And at that time, I think I was still an unconscious competent. I just followed whatever he told me to do. But it was almost like you weren't even, you were just doing something, but could you repeat it? I remember that was my, my, one, my one big insecurity at that time. Well, now what? And at the time, I just said, I've got to play a bigger game. And really, when I look back at it, what really changed for me is I became sufficiently motivated. And I think that's a very important fact for anybody who creates success, where your back is against a wall, where you have to perform. And that was the part I was. And the funny thing is, at that moment, I didn't know where my life was taking me when I made that decision. Well, I ended up becoming best friends really close friends and i always say bob is one of my closest friends we worked side by side for 13 years and i was a sponge to everything he taught me and he really taught me how to win big and he taught me how to think big there's all this you know a lot of books on thinking big and but i had somebody who had been doing this for at the time i met him 50 years or so you know and he really taught me to think big and I learned so many lessons and I learned how to serve. And I really think that was a big thing for me is learning how to serve that changed my life more than anything, because I had such a great example. And I was a great student to become a great leader. You have to be an amazing student. You've got to be a great follower. Napoleon Hill talks about that in think and grow rich. And I became you know, Bob would always say you're one of the best students I've ever met because if I told you to do something, I never worried if you were going to do it. I just accepted the idea. And, you know, so much has changed. Like I've mentored over 30,000 people in over 100 countries now with the partnership that I had with Bob and the Proctor Gallagher Institute. And it just, um, it was, you never know when one decision is going to change your life. And that was the decision that really changed my life. That's incredible. Arash, thank you so much for sharing that. Like, I feel like I'm speaking to Bob as well through this because you, you, it's fair to say you've become Bob Proctor's top coach. Like you've, you've elevated at every level and there's so much to unpack in what you just said. So 
even even the part around elevation right you, you didn't just want to transform once you wanted to keep doing it and repeat it and i think that's something worth kind of diving into yeah you know bob if anybody who's listening has ever followed him he teaches paradigms and uh, you know the paradigm we have to understand if we're going to change our results and it's a multitude of habits stored in a section of our subconscious mind well there's only two ways we could change them. One is through space repetition and elite level coaching. The second way is an emotional impact. Well, emotional impacts nine out of 10 times are something negative, right, Tim? Mm -hmm. And when I made that change, I said, I, anybody can do this once. That was my motivator. Anybody can do this once. I've got to repeat it to make it a part of my paradigm. And I didn't just want to repeat it. I wanted to create a massive quantum leap. I wanted to continue making quantum leaps part of my self identity. And when I did that early on, and I promise you, I really mean it. I did it very unconsciously, but I, I kept setting the bar so much higher for myself. And I, I talk about standards a lot. Standards are very important to me. And I believe our personal standard is our DNA to success. And I kept upping my game, upping my standard. And, you know, Bob would joke with me, he goes, I, I didn't know what I had in you until I, I measured your heart. And you can't, you don't know, like, I didn't know what I had either. Mm -hmm. And, and really, when we choose in, we have to choose in with an open heart. And that's what I did. And when you choose in with an open heart, it is limitless where you can go, you literally take off the ceiling. And there is no ceiling. You know, so I made what my what my greatest accomplishments were, were my floor with my next goal. And then I keep doing and I still think in those terms that I don't know how far I can take this. And I don't think anybody knows how far they could take it. But I always tell anybody who wants to listen that if I can do it, anybody can do it. I really believe that. I think greatness is easy to become because there's so many great leaders out there. There's so many great teachers out there. And the, the great part of it is the greatest accomplishments that people have made, they want to they want to bring everyone with them. They want to teach it to the people. That's why I say greatness isn't hard to become because there's so many people doing so many amazing things right now. And they just you just need to be bold and really ask for as much as you can. And that's that's what I did as, as long as I was with Bob. We kept asking. And I kept asking him and I said, how can I get better? Where can I get better? And because I was I was very secure at this point and letting him give me any feedback. I really appreciated if he was critical of me, uh, because when you were working with Bob, Bob wasn't just, OK, here you go. He was firm with you, like he would tell you if something was not right and he would tell you if you didn't do it, but he never hold it against you, but he always held you accountable. And that accountability really impacted my life quite considerably. So that's huge. There's a big change that you went on and it, and it came from working so closely with Bob. And can you just talk a little bit about the role of the heart regardless, regarding the mind and vibration and, and imagination and some of these higher faculties? Because... I think people don't know especially enough about what that actually means. Yeah, I think the heart is everything, uh, you know, and most people have scarcity in their heart. And the first thing we have to do is remove that scarcity. And I can tell you, I was at the first of the list with scarcity. And I looked at my past failures or my past setbacks. But when I really decided to change my life and you want to really get that word I use decided. And you're not going to change your life if you make just make a decision. You have to make an irrevocable, irrevocable, committed decision. This is what I'm doing no matter what. But there's no such thing with an irrevocable decision without great discipline. Because you can't go further than you are with the same set of discipline. You and I cannot grow further than we are right now with the same amount of discipline that we have. Well, when we're leading with our heart, that's the greatest gift we have because that's where our true greatness is. You've heard it before, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Well, the heart of hearts is where our subconscious is. And our subconscious 
is limitless, it's no more difficult to create the ideal relationship, the ideal weight, $1 to a million dollars in our subconscious. But we've got to understand that we have to understand ourselves to be able to do it. And when we lead with the heart, we're leading with the best version of ourselves. We have more power in our heart, in my opinion. I can't prove this, but in my opinion, from what I've experienced over the last 13 years, we have more power in our heart than any other place that I've experienced. Because when, when somebody can be on this call and say, well, no, the brain is really powerful. Well, yes, I agree, but the heart is where we get our desire from. Mm -hmm. Our desire mm -hmm. starts in our subconscious mind. It knocks on our conscious mind and says, hey, this is your want. Before I can make it into a desire, which it, you have to bring it back to the subconscious, but it starts with a want. Well, our want is the essence of who we are. So this overweight, you know, kid who was not using his potential is how I would look at myself. And I was not using my potential because I wasn't aware of what I didn't know. And then once I became aware, my whole life changed. But that awareness started with this, this inkling in my heart that says, come on, there's more for us to do. And I know, Tim, you, you understand what I'm talking about. And there's people listening right now that say, you know, I feel that way, but I'm scared. Or can I really do it? And they ignore it. Most people let their wants go within a moment, within a few minutes, within a week. They let it go because they're letting the outside world dictate their self-image. And so what is happening? The outside world is controlling their thinking. And we can only go as far as we stretch our thinking. Man, that's so good. That's awesome. Talk about desire. This, this is one of my desires to speak to you and have this conversation. <laughs> this is absolutely phenomenal. And I think that's it, right? So looking at external results and then trying to work out how things happen rather than actually what it is, you've got to go from within, right? It's whatever's within is then going to create the result outside. And I know that you speak a lot about that. So thank you for sharing about that because what I think as well is that a lot of people, they don't have a big enough one. I think going back to your earlier point around expanding that thinking and thinking big, can you tell us what happens if the want isn't big enough? Because obviously to, to use you as an example, like you had your 150K in debt, you had your, your big job loss and then something changed and then you became coachable. And I think there's parts of this that are worth exploring because your story is just so good. Well, thanks Tim. You know, I, if I look back, I think the thing that changed I chose into my life I wasn't just existing anymore. And I put myself out there when I had nothing backing me. So I had to perform, but I chose in to say, at that moment, I really believe my self-image grew significantly in the moment that I said no to what was comfortable and said yes to the unknown. And that's where the magic happened for my wife and I. That is when our lives changed when I really chose in to my life and I chose in to doing what I loved, which when I started studying this, God, I was just so fascinated by it. That's all I wanted to do. But the air I made, Tim, is when I was studying and it wasn't working mm. is I wasn't acting on the ideas. You know, Bob said a phrase to me. He says, you don't know this, you know about it. All I have to do is look at your results. That was an absolute game changer for me. And I said, that is exactly why I left all that knowledge in my conscious mind, but I never transferred it into action or getting emotionally involved with what I wanted. So that's why, to answer your question, that's why the wants stay small. People are setting their goals or setting their wants based on what they think they can achieve, but there's no inspiration there. There's no growth there. There's absolutely none. I'll tell you a story that really shifted things for me and my thinking. So Bob came to Scottsdale and he was filming and we, he had a program called six minutes to success. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, I said, you know, can I come watch you film? Anytime I could be around him, especially in the beginning, I was a sponge, you know, and he said, sure. So, I mean, this man at every take, it was one take, one take, one take. I couldn't believe it. 
it was like I was watching Picasso and it was so amazing. Anyway, we're at this break and he was taking a break and he said, I just achieved my first big goal. And he said, what's your next goal? And I told him and he didn't like it. And he said, because it wasn't double or triple what I just did. Because I told you earlier, I was worried, can I do it again? Anyway, he looked at me straight in the eyes and he said, you know, this is not a good goal. And I said to him, well, what do you think it should be? And I said, double. And he said, do you trust me? And I said, yes. He said, will you do what I tell you? I said, yes. I remember I had this blank stare and I almost felt sick. And I committed to him that I was gonna double my, my goal. And I walked out of there. Him and I had such a laugh about this years later. And I walked out of there and I achieved that goal in four months. Wow. In four months, I achieved it. But I really surrendered to the process. Like if I told you, if I tell you I'm gonna do something, it's done. Like, like no matter what, even back then, if I give him my word, it was a done deal. Like I'm committing to it. Now, I don't know how long it's gonna take, but you can, you could take it that I'm gonna put my whole heart and put everything into it because I already saw it once. I just had to put myself on the hook again. And that's when, that's when really amazing things come. When you put yourself on the hook and you say, I don't know how it's gonna happen, but here, here's, the, here's one of the greatest secrets that I discovered. If you set a goal much greater than you, that you really want it, that your want has to be through the roof. If your want is not through the roof, you're not gonna get it. Your want has to be through the roof and you're not gonna know what to do next. That's the trick. And you've got to be okay with that. Your spirit's going to know what to do and it will communicate through your intuition. That's one of our faculties. That's how you'll know the next step. But most people are driven by their intellect. And so their intellect stops them. Their intellect goes into logic. And we want to be illogical. Logic kills more dreams than anything. Logic and doubt, I will tell you this, kills more dreams than any other form. It's greater than fear. You know, fear is a blessing to us. It gives us feedback of what's going on inside. But when we're using logic, I'll do this when that happens. The whole paradigm is in control. And then the paradigm makes your decisions. Your paradigm sets your goals. And that's why people are setting too small of a goal. Amazing. Yes. So that, that's it, right? So people, I'll do this when, because they're looking for that external result rather than trusting themselves within and then figuring out the how, because shouldn't be about how, right? It's you're going to attract the how. The how's going to come from the ether, come from ideas, people, the right situations. Your vibration is going to attract that. So this this is just remarkable, remarkable stuff. So how have you taken all of that process that you've learned and obviously working very closely with Bob and developing yourself as well and, and your own students and mentoring 30,000 people? What does your morning routine look like for you? And how how does that apply now that you've reached because obviously you're, you're going to keep trying to expand and double and, and make this life go as far as it can go yeah i mean your morning routine to me is so important now i think how you start your day is how you own your day and so our morning really creates a significant impact the rest of our day for me i have young kids now i mean i've started this years ago when they were a lot younger but i have an eight and a ten year old i want to get up well before them because I get this quiet time where I'm focusing on me. Now, when I get up in the morning, I don't look at email. I don't look at text messages. The first thing I do is I exercise. I exercise first thing I do because, and it doesn't have to be long, but I want to get my blood flowing and really have a win to start the day. And I don't, I don't even consider it my main exercise. And so I'll go walking. I walk my dogs or I'll, I'll do anything that's gonna get me going for 20 minutes. And now I'm walking my dogs every morning and I'll go for you know 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Then when I get home, the next thing I do is I auto-suggest my goal. Auto-suggestion, if this is a new term, is a suggestion from yourself to yourself of what you want. But I don't just do it, I do it for five minutes with a, with a song I like. Like I'm a big ACDC fan, that's my favorite band. So I'm listening to a song that really connects emotionally to me. So I'll listen to a song and the song's just in the background, but it gets me emotionally connected to my goal. 
because once I get my goal transferred from my conscious mind to my subconscious and my subconscious takes it, it's a done deal. So that's only five minutes. And then right after that, I focus and I do gratitude. I do gratitude twice. I do it first thing when I get out of bed and then I write my uh, gratitude list. I write five things that I, I'm grateful for presently and five things that I'm looking to bring into my life like it's already here. Now, the gratitude's an interesting thing for me. Gratitude, I really resisted writing it because I felt like it was an intellectual exercise. And Bob told me, no, keep writing it because writing creates feelings. Feelings create actions. Actions create results. He said, you're burning it in your subconscious when you write it. So I just kept writing it and writing it. And then after I wrote it, I'd ask myself, why am I grateful for this? Because I didn't want it to be just like checking a box. I knew gratitude is the vibration of abundance that I wanted to get really emotionally connected. So why am I grateful for my family? Why am I grateful for this interview we're doing? Why am I grateful for where I am in my life? You know, cause that would connect me with it. And then I, I do a, I am statements. I am happy. I am healthy. I do 20 I am statements. Well, because I know how important our self image is. So any chance I can do little things that are going to improve my image, I do it. Those I am statements take less than a minute to do. And then I do a, a quick meditation. I do a 10 minute meditation. But by the end of my morning routine, it's, it's less than an hour to do all this. And I've created all these wins, but now I have momentum working for me. Not just random momentum. I believe momentum is something we earn by the activities we do in our thinking. I don't think it's a random thing. I think momentum is something that you want to keep playing with. And when you get momentum, oh boy, you're going to be more productive. So that, that's what I do with my morning routine and I'll change it up. I'll do it a different order so I don't get used to it because anything I used to get used to, I always guard against just checking a box. I want to get emotionally involved in everything I do. And that's a big piece, right? Connecting the emotion to, to overcome the logic, to, to burn through. How do you think people get stuck at the moment then if, if they're doing the self-help things? Like, I mean, you've just explained it. If, if Araj Vasugi is doing that every morning, that's the level of discipline you've got to have to be maintaining and moving forward that standard and expanding. But where do you think people are getting stuck if, if they're reading the self-help books, if they're listening to podcasts, if they've got their favorite kind of speakers or mentors that they're listening to? Is it a misunderstanding around the amount of repetition that they need to have or is it what what's the blocker at the beginning to then get that momentum well a couple of things and uh, number one most people don't have a definite goal that they're committed to right. without right. a goal nothing moves without a goal there's no reason for me to be disciplined without a goal there's no reason for me to stretch so without a goal there's no reason for me to really develop a positive mental attitude uh, but the other thing is they stay stuck because they never change their identity. They never create identity-based behaviors. So they're working with the same model, trying to change the result. You see it all the time in people uh, looking to release weight. They go on a diet, but they don't change their behaviors. They don't change the image of themselves. So their, their results are very small. They're, they'll create a lot of weight loss, but they gain it back. People who want to earn money, let's say sales professionals, they go and say, you know what, I'm going to prospect, I'm going to prospect so much more, I'm going to work on my presentation, and I am committed this month that I'm going to do better. And then what happens next month, they never change their identity, they never said, I'm going to work on changing my image of myself, seeing myself at a hundred month earner, I'm going to, but I'm going to just keep doing the things because I've heard those are the things we're supposed to do. And so they never change the identity. So if you don't change the identity and the identity is incongruent of who you are, the, it is only gonna last for a very short period of time. Wow, that would have just helped so many people, especially in the context of business. I, I see this a lot with salespeople. They might get that big win, they, they do the activity, they get that short-term win, but then they always come back to their base level, which is kind of exactly what you're saying around, they haven't shifted anything within. So from the context of business, then if, if someone wants to elevate, they want to earn more money, how would someone go about becoming more prosperous, more money conscious? 
Well, they want to create a wealth consciousness in their mind. And so they want to start, first of all, working on their image. The first thing I would do is I would encourage them to get out a piece of paper because it starts with a want and write down exactly how you want to live in the present tense. I am so happy and grateful now that I am earning 100000 or more every month and I love it. I am operating with a positive mental attitude. And if I say I'm going to do something, I act on it right away. And then they keep listening to it, record it, write it over every day, write it over, over and over and over again, write it 50 times a day. You're right. You're rewriting your new self image. But what happens, Tim, is most people, they won't do the repetition. They'll do it for a couple of days. They won't do it for six months because the paradigm is stronger than their want. And they are not in love with repetition because it makes no sense to our paradigm. Our paradigm says, come on, what are you doing? You've already done this. And then they say, Rosh, I'm bored of this. And I said, do you want the results? If you want the results and you want to win, you have to have practice and discipline. And that's how, and you want to create a wealth consciousness, see wealth everywhere in your mind, build your imagination. Your imagination is working all day long. We want to build it and we want to really keep great attention on what we're imaging. We're imaging what we want. Most people are imaging what they don't want. Well, when you start falling in love with the idea of repetition, I, I fell in love with it. I have fallen in love with the idea of expanding myself. Well, when you gain the awareness, your life is going to change. So if anybody's sitting there right now and saying they, they're, they plateaued, I will tell you right now, that means you've got to work on your image. Your, imo, your image has plateaued. And your image, you can never earn more than where your self-image is conditioned. You want to burn that idea in your mind. We can change our image, but we can never outperform it. And so if I'm going to create a wealth consciousness, I did it this exact way that I'm telling you. I would write out my goals every day, 50 times a day. Now, did I like doing it? I did not. I really didn't like doing it. But when Bob told me, write it out 50 times a day, I wrote it out. And it would take me about an hour to do. And at the time, I was like, I don't think this is working. I didn't see anything, but I, I had a very undeveloped mindset at that time. But where, where I moved ahead is I surrendered to the process. So we have to surrender to the goal achieving process on how we do this. See, people have heard about goals. And this is a goal that you're asking me about really improving their wealth. Well, what are goals? Goals are for us to grow. They're not for us to get. And as we grow, we're going to receive greater gifts than anything you could imagine. But when you fuse with the idea, fusing with the idea means your belief is matched with what you want, where you become one with it. When you're one with it, then you're not worried when it's going to happen. Most people get stopped because they're they're getting on the scale or they're looking at their paychecks, they're looking at their sales numbers, they're looking at nothing changing, but there's a window, sometimes it's 30 days, sometimes it's 45 days, sometimes it could be six months where you don't see anything. But remember this, Price Pritchett in the book U Squared says it beautifully. He says, the evidence, the absence of evidence does not mean there is not things going on behind the scenes. And you have to understand that when we when we let go of the outside world dictating my attitude, the outside world dictating my goals, the outside world dictating what I can do, that's when you're going to get real freedom. That's when you get in control of yourself. That's that's it. Right. That, that's everything. That you, you just so well put that so people can really, really grab onto that. Do you do you think that then if you're someone that's aspiring to have freedom in your life, but you're maybe questioning the process because effectively you've got to do these things. They might seem a bit strange. You might get bored. Is it the fact that the goal is not big enough to inspire you? Or is it the fact that you personally just haven't brought awareness or got enough awareness to understand that this is the process? There is no magic secret. This is the secret in terms of how you move your life forward, how you change things. You know, for me, I think uh, that's a great question. For me, if I look back at when my goal was freedom, that was my first goal. I didn't know exactly what I wanted. So I said, I want to create a life of freedom. Well, mm. I, I fell in love with that idea. And I think with our goals, we got to fall in love with it. 
And when I fell in love with it, what I did is I got in harmony with it on an intellectual level, on a subconscious level, then on a physical level, I saw it in my results. Mm -hmm. And I know that to be true. However, what, what I encourage everyone to do is do it until you've proven you can't do it. And you'll find that if you do the right activities, you, you change the behavior, you change the image, and you start seeing yourself and building this bigger idea of yourself, bigger image. Imagine that you were earning 10 times more. And if you played that image three times a day, if you played it three times a day, you're going to see, because the, the whole creation process and it starts like this. We get a want and we get emotionally involved in it. And we have to burn that idea in our subconscious mind. Well, how do you do that? You do it through auto suggestion, writing the ideas and imagining it. And I tell my clients to put an alarm clock on their phone, Tim, every two to three hours and let it go off. As soon as it goes off, you do those three things. You'll, you'll repeat the goal out loud for two minutes. You'll write it out and you'll imagine it for a minute. And I said, in 30 days, what happens is that goal is burned into now a desire, but this is a beautiful part. It's not just, the desire is not just in your subconscious mind, it's in universal subconscious. And the whole universe will conspire on your behalf to make it a reality. Now that's a big idea. Like when I heard that first, when Bob taught me that, I said, come on, like, <laughs> are you serious? Like, I'm telling you, but when you do it, it will work, I promise you, but it takes a great amount of practice and discipline, practice and discipline. And if anybody commits to do it, I promise you, if you commit to do it for 90 days, you'll see how much your life is going to change. Insane. I love it. That's so good. So I love also what you say about do it now and getting people in the habit of being able to do it now so that they step through that uncomfort that they've got and they start to move their paradigm and because the paradigm is going to come and try to bring you back to where you already are. Like we, we know this, but how important is that implementation process? Because I know you did talk about the emotional impact when Bob sat you down and said, Hey, you're not accepting these ideas. You've just got to accept that it's done. Yeah. How important is then accepting and then actually giving yourself a command? Well, I mean, it's huge doing it now and accepting ideas are two of the biggest lessons I implemented in my life. And I want to emphasize implement because if you don't work the ideas, the ideas don't work. Now, there was a time that I achieved another goal and Bob called me to congratulate me. And I always joke that you got to be very careful what you said around him. And he's probably laughing at me right now. <laughs> and I said, he said, I, he said, well, why? I said, why can't I do this all the time? He says, well, why do you think? And I said, I guess I don't know. He said, well, you haven't accepted the idea. I said, that's it. He said, that's it. This isn't rocket science. From that moment, may God be my witness. I started accepting ideas right away at that very conversation. I talked about a paradigm shift can happen with a emotional impact. Usually it doesn't or space repetition. Well, this was the emotional impact where I acted on that idea right away. Well, with doing it now, we have a couple second window before the paradigm comes in. Imagine you say, I am going to double my income or I'm going to release this weight or I'm going to buy my dream home. And you have to tell yourself and act on that idea. Well, how do you act on it? You do one action step first. Right away, you do an action step and you call somebody and say, I want you to hold me accountable. I'm getting it out of myself so I can put myself on the hook. Well, as you do that, you're doing it now. That's a small step to do it now. Do it now came from a gentleman by the name of W. Clement Stone. Uh, he did a lot of work with Napoleon Hill. They wrote a book together called Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude. And he had three words. He said, do it now. And he brought himself from failure to success. And, you know, Bob got to work with him and got to know him. And he told me this lesson. And he said, do it now. And when he did, when he did that, and I said, well, I watch you. That's what you do. Well, that's what I'm going to do. You know, success leaves clues. And you, you want to really follow this. It's so contagious. It is so contagious when you follow it. If anybody follows what I'm telling them, I guarantee they're going to win. Like that, some people will say, oh, that's a big thing. I promise you, I've worked these ideas and I've duplicated them and I've duplicated myself. So I know, and right now I don't even need you to believe it. You just need to believe my belief and go and test it for yourself. 
I do a rush. I'm I'm all in. <laughs> I definitely yeah, yeah, I, do. I believe you. Like I can see through every fiber of your being and you well, everything that we can't see as well, that yes, you know what you're talking about and that it, it would happen, that it is going to happen, that when you get an idea and the same can be for others, it's done. You've accepted it. And I guess just to be challenging in this sense, that I know some of the audience members would say, well, how can I accept the idea as done when I don't feel like that inside? Like what's got to shift mentally for them I think, to get out of their head and to start being like, okay, yes, it is done. That I can see that it's done and I'm, I'm feeling, because I, I know what that feels like. And you know then that you're going to start attracting that coming into your life and, and the right things are going to happen. And it's an amazing, amazing way to live. Well, we got to understand why, because I was the same way. I told you that when I first got mentored, I didn't think it was going to work, but I yeah. took that disbelief and was neutral. It wasn't meaning that I believed it, but I did not believe it. I opened my heart to what's possible. Now, what happens when somebody says, oh, how can I believe this? They're letting their past results dictate that. But what we have to do is we're creating our future, like you and I, Tim, right now on this call, we're creating our future identity of what we do going forward. Like our future is created in this present moment. So if I would have looked at my past, I would have said, you know, I was a nice guy. I was motivated, but I lacked discipline. Mm -hmm. And I, I, my attitude was up and down. My attitude was great when things were going well, but it was down when things weren't. And so I could look at anything I wanted to look at. I chose to say, well, my way is not working. Why don't I try another way? And that's what I did. So if anyone's sitting there, I don't, I'm not in the biz business of convincing people. That's what they've got to do with themselves. And the three words that you want to really fall in love with is act as if. Mm -hmm. When you mm -hmm. act as if, because there's a lot of people creating success. You've interviewed a lot of great people on your show. I was looking at some of your guests and you've, you have interviewed a lot of people who brought themselves through a lot of adversity from the bottom to the top. You know, I don't know anybody who's created true success that was handed to them. And adversity is what you're talking about. They're feeling that doubt and that doubt is real. It is not like somebody woke up today and say, you know what, I'm just going to be a hard ass and I'm just going to try to make the opposite. Right. Yeah. But yeah. that's their paradigm. But we want what we want to do is understand our wants dictate what we attract. Our wants come from the essence of who we are. And when we understand that, that means if it comes from the essence of who I am and who you are, that means we are meant to fulfill this want. And our job is to build the idea, work at it, overcome the adversity, because I promise you, you're going to have a lot of adversities if you're going to achieve something great. Remember this, small adversity, small triumph, big adversity, big wins. It's going to really be big because adversity we want to stand up to, not shrink. And if you go look at all of this, when we talk about paradigms, back in January, I told Bob because I was looking at all these new concepts that I was uh, putting into practice around self-image. And he said, you know, Rush, the paradigm is based around the self-image. And I said, yeah, I figured that out. You know, like I figured it out. We joked about it because um, I told him, I said, once you change your image, everything else changes. Because think about this, your image is the blueprint of who we are. And our image is right now, it's based on our past failures and successes. Well, when we learn how to activate our success me mechanism, as Maxwell Maltz teaches in Psycho-Cybernetics, well, as we learn to activate that, eventually by using our imagination and developing our higher faculties, that's our will, our perception, our memory, our imagination, our intuition, and our reasoning. Well, as we develop that, we're going to have a lot more successes that we're going to continue to activate where the past failures are going to be so small. And, and the great thing about elite performers, if you study them very closely, anybody, the elite performers are willing to fail over and over again. But the greatest part is they don't think it's failure. They just think, oh, there's something I just missed on that. But the people who are wanting to go from mediocre results to a leader result, they're trying to be perfect. They're working on, oh, I gotta be perfect. So they don't act on ideas. Mm -hmm. Where the elite performer, it's not aim, fire, shoot. Sometimes it's shoot, fire, aim. 
And we want to act on these ideas and, and embrace failing is such a good thing. Uh, and I'm sure some of your guests have told you this, but for me, I look to fail every day. And it doesn't mean by the end of the day, I look for the end of the day to be a failure, but I'm looking to open my heart to really play full out because when I'm playing full out, then I'm taking risks. And if I'm not taking risks, I'm not gonna win. And when you make winning part of your identity, it's game over. And the more you win, the more you make it part of your identity. So the next goal, you're gonna be able to accept that idea. You're talking to somebody who now has been studying this for 15 years, got mentored 13 years ago, who was not winning. And now I've made winning as part of my identity. So now I know I can continue to win. And that's why I keep working with a bigger and bigger idea because I, I don't know how far I can take this. I really don't. But I know thinking makes everything so. Bob used to always tell me that. He said, everything is, but thinking makes everything so. So what I think is a big goal could be a small goal to somebody else listening to this or somebody else who thinks that their goal is big. It really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I want people to live how they want to live because when I got a hold of this information, I said, God, I just want to get this in the hands of so many people. And that's why I'm so passionate about it because it emanates from me because I know how much it changed my life, not just from a prosperity standpoint. It changed my character. It changed how I am as a father. It changed how I am as a friend. It changed how, how direct I am with people so I can help them because I really believe that I'm taking from them if I have something that I can help somebody with. Arash, honestly, this is this has been one of the well, it has been the best conversation I think I've ever had. Like this is this is a dream come true for me, and I know for many listeners, and you will have touched millions of lives just through this conversation alone. And I know that when you go back to your values, that that is part of your character. You want to leave an impact, and you you are certainly doing that. And I just want to say it's been a blessing to have you on the show. And I know that there's so much in this that I'm going to personally go back and rewatch. Like I'm going to study this material. I'm going to go back. And I know that everybody who listens to this will also, but some of the things you just said in that last piece, just playful out, like working with a bigger idea. These are all such great concepts that I know that if people explore and follow you, how can they, do that like how can they get in touch with you in terms of what what should they do next around the proctor gallagher institute around your work and how can they work with you to go on this journey if they do want to do self-identity changes and elevate yeah i would recommend them go into my instagram i put out a lot of content it's vasugi a um and i could send that to you it's v-o-s-s-o-u-g-h-i and the letter a Mm -hmm. um, they could go, I have a private Facebook group where I put a lot of content out and I'm not really sure what that handle is, but I can get that to you as well. And really, uh, they can always email me. It's Arash, A-R-A-S-H at proctorgallagher.com. And, you know, anything I could do to help anyone I'd love to do, because I know how much I always tell people, Tim, one idea changed my life. Mm -hmm. It started with a decision. Then it was attitude, then it was discipline, then it was standard, then it was working with a bigger idea of myself. All these started with just one idea. And if somebody's sitting there right now wanting something bigger, fall in love with the idea that if I can do it, you can do it. I promise you that. I promise you, if you're sitting there and you have this want, go after it. Just say yes to you. We have this power, it's called affirmative power. That's our yes power. And we can access it at any time. And that's what I would recommend. Rush, it has, you've given so much. You've served, you've, you are just an amazing, amazing human. I know that you've got probably lots of meetings it's late in the evening for you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming on and talking to us today. Thanks, Tim. It was my pleasure. <laughs>